Welcome. We are so happy that you're with us today, our dear patrons and all of our followers, um, in the first installment of Inside Jacob's Music Center as we look at the transformation of this nearly 100-year-old venue into a state-of-the-art home for the San Diego Symphony Orchestra. Today's topic is entitled Preservation, and for those of you who know this hall and those of you who don't, um, it is a storied and historic venue. And looking at that history and understanding how we're preserving that is an important part of this renovation. We are coming to you today from inside the construction site, and if you can hear in the background, you know everyone is hard at work today. Um, you're going to hear a lot of that busyness uh, as, we, as we talk to you today, but in particular, we are situated here in the old projection booth, uh, which had not only spotlights, but of course the carbon arc projectors that brought this theater to life back in 1929 for incredible films in a hall that was also designed for live music. So we are happy to be with you and tell you a bit of this story. Remember to put into chat any questions you might have. We'll have a Q&A at the end. And now I'd like to introduce John Frame from HGA Architects, who's principal designer, and he's going to talk you through some of the most important and intrinsic um, details of this renovation and its focus on, on this preservation. So John, welcome. Thanks for having me here, Martha. It's really exciting to be here to talk with you all. So give us a little bit of the timeline. I mean, I remember when we first talked and when you're team put together a presentation and not only were we impressed with your design concept as architects but we were particularly impressed with this idea of historic preservation your excitement at working with an old hall and kind of bringing it refreshing it bringing it vitally into the 21st century but while preserving its character yeah so um, yeah, our work, our, our firm's work is uh, a lot of things within this sort of preservation realm, um, within the arts and the visual arts. And so you know, your, your project was unique, um, but it also is part of a really incredible group of historical theaters and performance spaces around the country that are really trying to understand how to breathe new life into you know, their second, third, fifth generation. Um, and in working in these theaters, what we've also found is each one is really unique. Um, they have their own kind of history, and we'll talk a little about that. Um, they have their own new sets of needs, and, and honestly, a lot of them have been managed through a range of care over the last you know, sort of century of their life. Um, so we, we typically look at these and we say, you know, what can we do um, to preserve things? That's, that's the most important thing. Um, and what can we do to not demolish anything of value? Your, your first value is like, don't, don't change anything you don't have to. Um, and then the kind of last thing we think about is, you know, how do you look at things that have already perhaps been modified? Perhaps it's hard to bring them back to their historic character. And what can we do to, that, to those areas to solve the current contemporary problems? And, you know, that was really a strategy we took here. And, um, you know, the building was really a generous partner in doing that. Um, you know, it's, it's history for maybe you know, everyone here that doesn't know it. Uh, it was built in 1929, um, designed by a firm Weeks and Day, uh, opened one month before the crash, uh, but uh, through, I think, some very um, hard work on those, the founding developers of it, they kept this running all through the, the Depression. Um, and so, you know, it operated as a silent movie house, and so as part of that, um, a couple unique things about a movie theater. So we think about a movie theater and nowadays, rows of seats, a screen. Back when they first opened these movie houses, they were actually a little worried uh, that people would be willing to sit there for you know a couple hours and watch a show. Um, so they incorporated two interesting features. One was they designed these really elaborate movie houses because they figured they needed another draw to get people to come in. Um, the second was they designed them to actually have performances as well. So what you have right behind us here is a full stage house. Um, and so accompanying those movies was often um, live performances. Um, this was in the day of the silent movies when it first opened. So there was also a really elaborate organ, um, an organ you actually all, or they got from the, Bal the Balboa Park, and that came here. 
huge organ. We can talk a little more about that later, and because that's been part of some of the updates we've been doing with this project. Um, so, opens in 29. Um, the story goes that there were 100,000 people at the opening in a town that was only 150,000 of you in San Diego at the time. So, really, really kind of impressive history. Um, it operated as a movie house. Uh, until the speakies came along. And then when the speakies happened, uh, the, the organ shut down. It operated for a movie house up until the 70s, and then it kind of went quiet for a while. Um, and then the symphony acquired it in 84, uh, and it was part of a really elaborate project. So um, you know, one of the things I think is really unique about what the symphony has here is um, while they dem de demolished the entire city block that this was on, all the supporting retail spaces, office spaces, they left intact this beautiful hall and all the key public spaces, the reception halls on the 7th, reception space that you enter off of 8th. And that's a really unique feature for halls like this, to have that sort of that well intact. Um, so when it first opened, they did a, you know, a few improvements around the hall to kind of um, fine-tune acoustics in various places. Um, and that was some subsequent work that happened throughout the, the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. Um, uh, patron amenities, the bathrooms and things like that were improved. But you know, what we're really embarking on here is uh, a much more ambitious rejuvenation of the hall. So um, as I said earlier, the hall was in really great shape, but it was also 100 years old. So you know, quickly working with you and your team, uh, you know, some key things we identified were life, safety, and health. And so there's been a lot of modifications we've made around improving that within the hall. And then all those things I talked about earlier with it being a movie house, a movie house isn't exactly the ideal format for, of course, a symphony. So we really worked hard to make adjustments to the hall to accommodate the needs of uh, you know, symphony and the acoustics around that, as well as to update the, the goals of the symphony and the goals of the institution to broaden uh, who will come here. So there's a whole new technical overlay that'll happen in the hall too. And I think some of these things we'll talk about, I think in some of the other conversations that we're gonna have coming up later this year. Um, but I think it's important to kind of frame it. So um, some, some big changes we've made to the space that we, that we see behind us here to improve the acoustics is we've opened up the proscenium and we're creating a whole new choral terrace on the stage level that will allow patrons to sit with the, with the symphony as well as to sit in the house and look at them. Um, and in doing that, we remove the balance over the top of the proscenium. And we'll talk a little about, about preserving and how you preserve things yeah. like that a, a little later, I think. I think um, that's one of the most dramatic changes that people will see when they enter for the first time. And those of us who are here and have seen it come down and now see it without, it's just a wow moment. Yeah. This is my first visit. They took down the scaffold thing. Yeah. And it is. You, you sit up here. We're right above uh, the balcony level seating. And you can see all the way to the back of the stage now. It's, it's really, really Which means incredible. the sound can get all the way out to the audience. And, you know, that the, uh, there's a great, a much bigger sound chamber for the yeah. orchestra. And that was a, a really big part of the strategy we all worked on together was how do we improve that sound? And so opening up that balance was part of it. Um, that's, the space has great volume. Volume, as we'll hear from our acquisition later, is you know, a key component of that. But then also, how do we control the sound? So again, movies, uh, we have speakers. Uh, you want it to be a very quiet space. With symphonies, we want it to be a fairly lively space. So um, we've also reshaped um, the, the back of the hall to create what are called tuning chambers on both the orchestra level and up on the balcony level. Um, and then uh, throughout the hall, we've, we've added spaces um, in areas that don't affect the historic fabric, and we can talk about this a little bit more later, um, to add a whole range of things that people just didn't think they needed, uh, yeah, certainly for a symphony hall in 1929. Um, so you know, our, the goal has really been to work within those found conditions as much as possible to, to make the necessary changes. So from design to the beginning of construction, were there any surprises? Yeah, some really, really great surprises. Um, yeah, when we, we first, you know, we did our visual walkthrough and we were, we were just struck with the, the, the beauty of the space and how well preserved it was. Uh, I think it is considered the best preserved of the Fox Theaters or one of the top five best preserved Fox Theaters in the country, which is, you know, 
a really phenomenal thing. And that even goes down to your mechanical systems. Um, they were in great shape. Unfortunately, they were 100 years old, so they didn't have all the state-of-the-art things we needed. But um, you know, that was a surprise, and it was a really beneficial surprise because it meant that we could really focus on making the necessary improvements and really protect those pieces that were historic fabric. Um, it has a nice story around the painting of the details. Um, uh, Heinsbergen uh, was a, Anthony Heinsbergen was a really famous uh, painter of these movie palaces across the country. I think he touched one in probably every state and maybe even on every continent. So he did all the original painting within this hall. And his son came back in, uh, in 1984 and actually repainted it. So over the course of his life, his head probably three, four, they think, kind of painting layers. But there's some DNA in there of the original painting. So um, that was really kind of a great find. Um, so one of the fun things to do is sit in the hall and look up and see what you can find. I mean, I think we could do a scavenger hunt at some point about all of the various different motifs and creatures and details. Yeah, it's a, they're a penelope of those. And you know, it was something that was an inspiration to us when we were, when we were working on the design. Um, so we talked a little bit about you know, kind of how you, you preserve things, how you save things. But also the hall really was a, an important touchstone for inspiration in the design. So as we were thinking about the new elements to come into the space, um, we really looked at the DNA of the hall, uh, both the kind of beautiful structure and ordering of it, but those details you talked about. And so I think people are going to be yeah, hopefully thrilled to see the way that the historic pieces have been incorporated um, in a way that really respects the historic, but then finds their way into things like the new acoustic ceiling reflectors and into the beautiful screen that's going to wrap the, the stage in the coral terrace. Um, the yeah, in interesting thing we also found in that process is that uh, that beautiful ceiling that uh, you've all seen above you in the hall, all that plaster is held together with horsehair, oh. um, which is uh, evidently incredibly strong. Um, so they don't do it out of horsehair anymore, um, but now as all these things evolve in a 20th century material, what do they do all those the details with? With hemp. So all the new restoration of those pieces will be done with that. So when I first heard this hall, first walked in, it struck me as sort of monotone, kind of gray. It was dark, it was a rehearsal. Um, and then when I came in my first week, I asked our great IATSE stagehands to shine some light up there, and it just comes to life. There's so much color, and I know you're going to amplify the, that color, but also the lighting of the hall will reveal what's been there all along. Yeah, there's so there, we've been working with a really talented lighting group that's actually part of our theatrical group, um, and they've been looking at a whole myriad of ways to really accentuate the details within the hall. Um, because as you said, you know, the current lighting, again, as a movie house, you know, lighting those spaces dramatically wasn't a really high priority. Um, so we've worked really hard to, to find the lighting to bring out that beautiful color rendition in that. Um, and in doing that, we're also referencing a lot of those colors in the new materials for the carpets, for the fabric, for the seats, um, into the new elements that are coming into the space. Speaking of lighting, of yes. course, there's the great central chandelier. Yes. Which evidently had dancers uh, that's a great suspended image. on opening night. I don't think we're going to recreate for the reopening of the hall. Um, but right now, we can't quite see it from here. It's below it, or it's below that. There's a barrier between us. but. The chandelier is being also renovated. It's gone out for yes. repair and cleaning and new glass. Yeah. New glass. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, one of the major renovation um, and restoration parts of the project. Um, so, you know, again, really unique for this space. Um, the chandeliers, often the chandeliers are the first things that you know, some owner over the course of the century makes off with. Um, and you know, sell it to an antique dealer or something like that. So all of your original chandeliers are here. Um, so they, the main big chandelier over the, the, the central space, as well as the four corner pendants, um, along with all the lights in the Angel's Walk and the lights underneath uh, the, the balcony or above your head when you're in the orchestra, have all been shipped off to coal lighting. 
Um, and they have a, a really great history of doing this. I think they've been in business for 112 years, and um, their expertise, uh, they've worked on various projects throughout Southern California, you know, many, many historic structures. Um, so they are taking those lights, and um, first they're going to bring them into their, they've just arrived at their, their house, and so they're doing a full evaluation. I was just talking with the owner yesterday. Uh, full evaluation of them to look at the materials, um, the detailing, how they're put together, the shape, the condition of all those elements. Um, and then in that process, they're going to identify you know, what can be restored, because the first thing they, they always want to do is restore, not replace. Um, and then as they do that, they'll understand what has to be restored, what has to be fixed, replaced. And then, of course, it's not 1929, so electricity, lighting, everything is completely new. So um, the strategy they've come up with for the main light is uh, it had 5,000 light bulbs in it. Wow. Um, nobody changes a new light bulb every time one of those five, uh, 500, excuse me, 500 goes out. Um, so it will now be all state-of-the-art LED lighting um, with full color control. Um, the beauty of that is an LED bulb lasts 10 to 20 times longer than um, yeah. an incandescent. Um, but then the trick was there were some really great lighting effects with some of those incandescent bulbs, that little flicker. Yeah. Um, so in areas where they want that to just really glow, they can now increase the quantity of lighting to really hit the effect that the original designer wanted to have those elements that really wanted to sort of blow out the light and glow. Um, but then when you really want those little points of light. They're, they have special little LEDs that will still give you that sparkle mm. up in the bulbs that line the exterior that you see. Um, so they're working really hard to, to kind of uh, emulate what was there originally. And then um, they've already identified that a lot of the glass in the lights had been replaced over the years, probably for various reasons. So um, they'll identify the best historic pieces of glass in that chandelier and then go out to special glass fabricators to replicate that. So we'll have um, glass that really accurately matches the historic. They must be thrilled to work on a project like this. Uh, it's it's there. It is the, the kind of heart of their work is, yeah. is helping these historic buildings bring back the, the life into their spaces. Yeah. And actually the chandelier also leads us to the colors of the seats and the colors of the hall, as you said, are also reflected in other finishes. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, as I mentioned, they think the hall's been repainted at least four times. Um, you know, some historic documents talk about some really um, far-ranging color schemes that happened in here. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's amazing that you know, uh, Tony Jr. Heisenberg and Jr. came in and repainted it in the 80s. So we know that there was some fidelity there with you know, his father's original intention. Um, and the ceiling, which probably um, not everyone's ever been able to see fully lit, as you noted, is just this incredible set of bright green blues and really rich mosaic of colors, um, along with a series of pendants throughout the space. And so originally, um, you know, the, the red seats and the red carpet really kind of ate the whole color scheme in the space. Um, so what we've done is we've gone and we've looked at all those other beautiful colors in the space and those, those colors are now being resampled in what will be the new carpeting um, underneath your feet in the lobbies as well as in the aisles uh, within the, the seating hall. And then the beautiful green that you see in the pendant on the ceiling will be, the, will be reflected in the new seats yeah. um, throughout the space. No, it's a, it's a, I think it's a beautiful color. And you know, across the front of the stage too and around the sides, these apricots and, you know, accenting with the green. It's, it's, I can't wait to see it all yeah. be finished. And a little repair here and there and plaster where perhaps holes were needed to add fans or whatever. We're going to fix all of that up yeah. too. Well, and that's where, you know, really interesting opportunities come in that just, you know, didn't exist before. So as we're, we're looking at areas that we have to patch and replace, because while it's in great shape, um, there's, there's places where people unfortunately dropped holes into the, that beautiful ceiling. Um, so as, uh, as folks have, uh, you know, seen, um, I think in the video you're playing some of this, um, the details that we've taken down, um, we've painstakingly preserved. A lot of them are living right now down in the lower lobby. And what they'll do with those is they'll make um, urethane molds of those. So we'll have a record of those forms and then we can recreate um, whichever pieces we need to as uh, kind of the edges of things are put back together. Um, so say underneath the balcony, um, you know, above your head in the orchestra seating, 
um, that ceiling is predominantly being preserved, but uh, some of the edges had been chewed up a little bit when some renovations had happened previously. Um, and so those are, we'll use all those old details to remake them and kind of seamlessly integrate those. Um, under that ceiling, it's interesting, uh, just going back to the lighting for a second, um, when it was a movie house, really dim lighting. Now right. it's a symphony, we need a little bit more light underneath that, but we didn't want to add any new lights that weren't part of the authentic character underneath, the, uh, underneath that balcony and the orchestra level. So what our lighting designers have come up with was they had these kind of acrylic uh, 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 glass planes on them that kind of diffused the light, but when you turned up the light really bright, it became really glary. So it actually wasn't a really pleasant kind of visual experience when you're underneath the balcony. So the original ten intention was to actually have a kind of glowing orb there. Mm. So behind those beautiful ornate grills, which are at Coles being restored right now, um, you, there'll now be a, kind of a void with um, a rim of uplight in them. So you'll just see a, a kind of beautiful void of light that will spill a nice diffuse light on, onto the seating in that uh, in the orchestra level, which would be uh, yeah, quite, quite, quite striking and much more balanced than the current condition. We touched on the fact that this was open during silent film era and and later Walt Disney was one of his favorite theaters and he opened a lot of his films here but um, in order to do silent film of course you needed an organ and you referenced that um, the organ has been preserved and is predominantly a theater organ which doesn't always make it ideal for performing with orchestra but yeah. we are now adding what I would call sim classic symphonic music ranks of pipes to this classic organ as part of this renovation. Yeah, so as, as part of the work to, as you say, kind of bring it into alignment with the symphony's needs, um, you know, a few things, you know, not all historic buildings are always done perfect. You know, we often think things that are historic were done right. But when they initially put in that organ, they actually kind of ran out of space for a few of the ranks, and they didn't have all the ranks they actually would have wanted. So uh, 300 pipes is a lot, um, 32 different ranks, uh, but what we've done in the design process is we've found a number of ways to actually or open the organ chamber more, more sort of directly to the seating hall behind the beautiful architectural details. So you won't actually see any of those openings, but the sound of the organ music will be able to move into the hall much more readily. Uh, we've also found um, opportunities to make the chambers for the organ a little bigger. And so what that's allowed us to do is there were a couple organ ranks that were kind of hidden up here in the upper part of the, uh, the hall, um, not the ideal location for them. So we, with finding that additional space, we've been able to bring those ranks down in, and they'll now be able to hang out with their fellow ranks um, in a configuration which is much more kind of amenable to creating the, the, the appropriate side type of music. Uh, we've also increased uh, the blowing capacity, the blower capacity. Um, so I think we've added one blower and then we've refurbished another blower. So uh, organs rely on that air to move through them, so um, there'll be much more capacity to move the air through the organ than previously. And I think you can easily reassure people who might think it's a little dusty in here for construction that that organ has been lovingly wrapped yes. and protected during this two-year period. Yes, the, the, the protections that the contractor has gone through around you know, a lot of the historic features as well as things like the organ has been very elaborate because yeah. that's, that's obviously incredibly important. So um, we haven't, you mentioned the Coral Terrace. Um, let's talk about the stage and then also let's talk about the various parts of the hall that you are touching because your imagination in utilizing space has been extraordinary. And I will, I will say that we had, on stage right and stage left, stories of space either side with an elaborate rigging system that could fly in scenery and so forth that were re really underutilized. Not today, not used much at all. Um, and yet the orchestra had very little space for storage, for uncasing their instruments to move around. And every time a chorus appeared with the orchestra, they had to take up stage space, which made the orchestra smaller in works that often the orchestra is already, by definition, by composer's intent, larger. So you want to talk about that, and, and, and I will introduce Paul Scarborough's name at this point, because he is your great partner's acoustician for this project, and one of the noteworthy elements of his renovations are choral terraces, including the about-to-open Geffen Hall in New York. Um, but Talk a little bit about how we've reorganized, how you've re-envisioned that stage space and how it, how it affects our musicians. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I, 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 I like that question in tying it to the, the historic preservation, because I think one of the things that our team really wanted to do when we looked at solving the stage problem, um, the fact that you didn't need a full stage, um, was how do, we, how do we do that in a way that really respects the history? Um, so on one stop of the history of this hall, there was almost a moment where they, they broke the kind of critical rule of uh, historic preservation, which is they were just going to get rid of that proscenium because they said it didn't work. Of course, that would have been a tragedy in this hall. Um, so we, when we looked at the solution, we said, we really want to keep that beautiful proscenium. And how do we work with all that volume that you just mentioned to um, improve the acoustics, to improve the flexibility of the stage? Um, and it, it, the dual solution and the great benefit of that was that the space behind the stage wasn't at all, there was no historic detail there. So we could do all these things and not actually hurt or affect negatively anything within the hall. Um, so what we devised um, was that idea of removing the valance across the top of the stage house, or of, of the, uh, the proscenium, which um, worked really nicely because it, it was purposely decorated with a curtain. And so it implied actually that it could lift away. So now you have the ability to actually drop a curtain in there and have it look just like it did historically, um, or we can fly it away, which really improves the acoustic coupling. We call it acoustic coupling between the stage house or the performance space and the, the audience. Um, and I should say Valens, it was a, as you said, it was a red curtain stapled on or attached to a structural beam, yeah. concrete. So the, the proscenium arch, the structure was revealed in that and hidden behind that red valance. And yeah. so it isn't just a matter of taking down the curtain, but we had to put in a transfer beam to maintain the support. Yeah. It was one of the great engineering accomplishments of this. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, another anecdotal kind of interesting history story um, was that the, the original builders of this, um, they really wanted uh, a more robust structure. So um, you know, one old engineer I was walking through with told me that you know, he heard from someone who heard from someone, so we'll all take this as anecdotal, um, but that they, when they originally built it, they said, double the amount of concrete in this building. And so um, the building being our, our good partner in doing this work, uh, I think that's one of the things that's allowed us to, while it was a major structural effort to open that up, um, there's been some really good bones here. And so the building has been a really good partner in fixing some of these things. Um, but yeah, so as you say, um, you know, the valance was actually hiding what they thought was a structural necessity at the time. And now we'll be able to let that beautiful um, proscenium really open itself up and I think probably be the original intention of the, you know, of the original architects that did the building. Um, and so and then in doing that, um, you're, you're mentioning Paul and the, the, uh, the Coral Terrace. Um, what that's allowed us to do behind the stage is to create what we call a fixed coral shell, um, and which is part of a fixed acoustic enclosure. And so the beauty of that is that that allows us to really control the way the sound moves back and forth from the performers um, to the audience. Um, what that also allowed us to do was to put in a series of acoustic ceiling reflectors um, to tune the, the space really accurately. And actually Paul and his group were able to come in and adjust those reflectors that folks are probably seeing uh, on the, in the renderings of the space. Um, and the design of those reflectors was also very important from a historic point of view because it allowed us to float those reflectors underneath the proscenium, allowing the proscenium to still move through the space without actually um, doing any damage to the proscenium. Um, and the design of it also allows us then to be able to fly the, we call, we call it fly away, so drop those reflectors down and actually move them off the stage. So when you're having a performance that doesn't need those, um, you can have that full proscenium open to the coral terrace um, and, and the performance space within it. And we will be having a session with Paul to talk about acoustics. Yeah. We'll also be talking about audience space and how we've reshaped that. There's, there's a lot yet to yeah. come. And some of the backstage support spaces I know are in a future, future uh, segment. Um, at this point, maybe we want to hear from some of our audience members in terms of their questions. Yeah. Um, I hope you've been sending some things into the chat, and I evidently have some here. Will there be silent movies with live organ next year? And, and by the way, that brings up the, the question right away that the hall is scheduled to open in the mid to late autumn of 23. Um, and I'm going to, after this question, I'm going to back up a little bit to talk about the timeline and when we started. But sure. will there be live movies with organ in the next year? 
I will, I'll take that question. Um, we're currently working on the 23-24 season. Um, it would be hard for me to imagine that we wouldn't return to um, some movies since this, that's its original intention. Um, but we haven't come up with the complete schedule yet, so stay tuned. Um, did you find anything surprising during the demolition phase? We did. Um, you know, it, it's, there, there's one thing you would see in, in architectural drawings, and we did find some old architectural drawings of the building. And then there's always things that you find um, that uh, they did on the fly when they were building it. So um, one of the things we found was underneath the stage, um, we thought that there was a whole series of steel beams and concrete slabs. And when we opened it up, we found that it was actually, it all been built out of wood like most people's houses are built out of. Um, and so that was actually one of those great finds and surprises where um, we were able to rectify something that probably wasn't as structurally robust as certainly we would want it today. And that did lead to a redesign and a removal of the original stage and yeah. now um, steel beams being put in place and yeah. uh, as we speak. So. I think one of the other you know, real surprises that we found was um, as we started to do the demo work, um, we were able to find so many spaces that we didn't know existed or we kind of thought there was something behind that wall. Um, and those became really incredible opportunities in the design to figure out, okay, how are we moving the mechanical through this building without having to put, say, grills in a beautiful uh, you know, old wall? Um, or you know, how do we start to route all the new tech equipment uh, and uh, you know, AV and things like that around the building? Um, and again, not affect the interior space. Um, or we need, we need things that didn't exist before. We need, uh, we need more practice rooms you know, for the performers. You know, we need more robust spaces for you know, other shows that come in. We, we need you know, important staff spaces and just technical spaces that didn't exist then. Um, and the, one of the real surprises was as we kind of dug into this, we found so many spaces in and around this structure um, that we've been able to utilize. And, and so I think as I said earlier, the building's been a very generous partner both in the design inspiration, but also in you know, kind of saving spaces that they built 100 years ago for us to use today. And when we began this process, there were no blueprints for the hall. They had been lost somehow. And during the course of this, two things happened. First of all, you did a laser scan of the entire hall. So we have now laser generated drawings. And then we located HGA, I believe, located the original blueprints in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, they they somehow ended up in an SOM uh, architectural firm had done the the Symphony Tower and the hotel, and so somehow those the historic drawings had landed in their lab, and uh, our historic preservationists they hadn't been able to track them down there. So we now have a copy of that wonderful historic yeah. set and there's of some drawings. Beautiful drawings. And there's such beautiful oh, drawings. Yeah. Um, we also discovered that. There was intended to be a walkway underneath the hall. Suddenly it looked like there was a passageway, which does not exist. And then underneath the seating area, we found these barrels, tin barrels, of, um, in case of air raid, uh, with water and iodine and supplies. Did you ever see those? I don't think I ever saw those. Oh my those gosh. Marshall. That's amazing. Yep. Oh, wow. I think they're still under there. So, oh. yeah, that was another surprise. That's incredible. Okay. Um, what is the most well-preserved part of the hall? That's a great question. Um, I probably want to directly divert my historic preservation colleague who isn't here, but I, I think the things that strike me the most, um, whether they are the most or not, is the ceiling. Um, and you know, part of that is just pure uh, distance and gravity, so it's Far, so far away that people can't really um, uh, modify it or uh, change it. And also gravity, the dust and things like that don't, dis don't tend to settle on it. So um, you know, for all of those reasons, I think it's probably the most intact. And um, coincidentally and fortunately, it's also one of the most ornate parts of the hall. So um, you know, maybe by design, they place the, the most sort of care and effort into this beautiful ceiling and it's therefore been the most preserved. And we will, as part of this project, when it's all complete, do a cleaning of the hall. We're not repainting it. We're not touching any of that. But we certainly will 
there's probably a little added dust as part yes, of the yes, project, so we'll little. get rid of that. Um, what new feature of the hall are you most excited about? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. Yes. You love all your kids, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, equally. Equally, absolutely equally. Um, I think that, and I'll speak for myself, not the rest of the team, but um, I'm really excited more about the, the general synthesis that we've achieved between the historic and the new elements. Um, and you know, I think a couple of those key features would be um, the, the acoustic reflectors and the, the tuning chamber screens that wrap um, both the balcony level, the lower orchestra level, and around the entire core terrace and the stage. Um, because I think they're going to be just such beautiful, striking elements that, that really create this beautiful synergy between 1929 and, 19, and 2023. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really probably most excited about that. And the fact that it, I think, ties into the solution of fixing the acoustics. And it ties into the idea of preservation. And it has this relationship to kind of increasing the kind of quality of the, the user experience. So as you mentioned, we're going to talk maybe a little in another episode about kind of the seating changes and things right. like that. Um, but I'm, I'm very excited about the way those changes are going to make your just your experience of enjoying the music and the hall you're in um, so much more enhanced once all that happens. I'm I'm really excited about the stage. I mean, the stage was the genesis of this. Yeah. Um, and I, having listened to this hall now for eight years, well, I guess not quite eight years because the last we haven't heard it for a year, but or so, but um, I think it has a wonderful natural acoustic that needs some reshaping, but I'm really looking forward to the connection the audience is going to have with the music and with the orchestra and vice versa yeah. um, in this renovation. I think is, to me, one of the most exciting parts and the part we won't hear or see until the very end. So. Yes. How challenging is it to update a historic hall or space and yet make it feel modern and new? I think it's very challenging. Um, and I, you know, it, to me, that's hats off to our whole team and to, to you, know, you and the leadership that um, really got behind doing this because it, it's hard. It, it's really hard to do that and do it in a thoughtful way. And I think probably everyone here and listening has been to a space that's been modified and you know there maybe there wasn't a lot of respect for the old um, or maybe there was um, you know a kind of uh, an aping of the old and you you kind of look at it and you're like that's not old I can tell they just built that last year and so I think finding striking that right balance between um, having new elements that are new and therefore completely respect the old elements um, and really letting the old elements shine and be part of their deep history. I think that's, that's the challenge and hopefully the balance that, we, that we've struck here in this project. Can you talk a little bit about, you mentioned the back wall. Um, first of all, this is now a, rather than demountable shell or a temporary shell, which was fairly thin, had to be because it had to be light enough to be moved. Yeah. This is now a fixed acoustic shell which means there's a wall behind the orchestra. In front of that, there's this incredible textured wall. I'd like you to talk about that and where it got its inspiration from and how it too, as, the, as one of the newest elements, reflects the old. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, what we're, ta we're, we're talking about here is it's technically we call it with a tuning chamber. And so that's where we're able to control the way the sound moves in and out. So um, yeah, not having it be demountable meant we could make a very substantial wall. So there will be a new um, multi-layered wall that allows us to really push the sound from the performers out onto the stage. Um, and that has a whole series of co components to it. So you have a very dense layer that move, helps move out the sound. On top of that, um, we have this kind of textured um, concrete surface that allows the sound to kind of diffuse. And then in front of that, you need to protect all of that. Um, in front of that, there's a curtain that we can deploy. And so that curtain allows us to actually dampen the space. So say we're doing something that's amplified, we can actually dampen the sort of sound in the space. And then that whole assembly has to be further protected. So we have a, a metal mesh screen. So it's this beautiful woven metal mesh um, 
the color the color that it would be um, finished in is being sampled um, from something that uh, kind of finds a harmony with the rest of the colors in the hall. And then the mesh has a pattern to it. And what we did was we looked at um, the vertical patterns that existed in the existing hall, and there's beautiful fluting, there's ribbed conditions, there's crenellated conditions. Um, and so we sampled a whole series of those. I think there's six different samplings of that. Um, and that they, they comprise panels that are two feet wide. And so that entire liner of the new stage and behind uh, the orchestra and balcony level will all be comprised of those beautiful woven metal panels that will be uh, very dramatically lit and be able to see through them just ever so slightly to see the kind of the curtain path, the curtain that moves behind it. Um, so like the, the hall itself, which, um, you know, it's you know, this beautiful finite box, but then you have the layers and the cavities behind the, the organ chambers, you have the angels walks, um, there's all this kind of detail that gives it a thickness, um, as opposed to kind of a hard solid wall on the stage, right. it has a kind of nice layer in depth like the rest of the stage. I thought when you revealed that and we were work, working together on that, the, the design component of that was brilliant. And it's, it is where you take the old and make it new. So I, th I think it's gonna be terrific. Um, what is the trick to succeeding this type of work? Um, and you talked about the team. I think, how many people have been working on this project? Well, I, I would th uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's actually 150 to 200 individuals in a range of design professions. So. Yeah, we're architecture and uh, historic preservation. Uh, we also, the, you the mechanical, you have your electrical, you have your acoustics, you know, first and foremost. Uh, you have your theaters, uh, you have your lighting folks, uh, you have your folks that are dealing with sustainability, uh, you have the folks doing the preservation, so the people both doing the preservation on the lights right now as well as pre preservation on other elements. I feel like I'm probably leaving out three or four Some other great specialties. Colleagues. Yeah, uh, but just, you know, incredible team of really, I think part of the question was how you succeed. Um, just a team of incredibly passionate people um, that just, they love performing arts, they love music, uh, they love historic structures, and it really takes a big group of people all coming together. And of course, you have the leadership of the symphony to say, this is really valuable. This is valuable to our community, it's valuable to the neighborhood, it's valuable to you know, the city of San Diego to really make the effort to preserve something like this. So. Some people ask, well, did you consider building a new hall? And yes, we did. We looked at that element. Um, I think the commitment to this building, and it's so many people, I, whenever we talk about the hall, they say, oh, I came here and I remember I came with my mother and I heard whatever, Sound of Music, whatever the film. It has a historic connection to San Diego and to refresh it in this way and preserve it in this way. It is a, absolutely intentional on our part, on the, the part of the San Diego Symphony Orchestra Association to make this commitment to downtown and to, as you said, one of the arguably most beautifully preserved halls and not to let it go away um, or be put into less use. So um, I think that is our commitment to this city um, and to its citizens, its listeners, its historic uh, listeners and the future. And one of the things as we look at the season as we were talking about, it is really looking into the future. Um, this is the home of the San Diego Symphony Orchestra. It's its indoor home. We have the shell, the Rady Shell at Jacobs Park, of course, is the outdoor home. And it's continuing the development and the support of the musicians of the San Diego Symphony Orchestra, their artistic legacy, led by music director Rafael Payari, um, to bring their music making to more and more people and to really put a focus on what a fine artistic ensemble, what a great artistic ensemble they are. So that's at the heart of this as well. John, it has been a pleasure, as always. Likewise. Your passion for this project is infectious, and we have, as we said, many, many subjects to, to um, still continue. This is a good overview in terms of the historic nature, but acoustics, lighting, um, the audience space, I think, which has a completely new configuration to bring our audience members closer to the stage, and the backstage space as well. Yeah. 
So I think if folks have questions that come up you know, between now and the next one, you know, I'd be, we'd be happy to revisit something about preservation if someone has a question on Absolutely. the next episode, right? Absolutely. Keep your questions coming. I believe our next session is in November when we will come back to you and reveal more. It's important that you are part of the process because the process is an important part of the preservation of Jacobs Music Center, Copley Symphony Hall. Happy to have you with us today, and we can't wait until you are able to join us in person to hear for the first time San Diego Symphony Orchestra in its newly renovated and, um, and luxurious hall. Thank you so much.